I'll just take this up. The first lesson of the day is never let Stuart introduce you. <laughs> because, because this is where I am and this is where Stuart say I am. So there's a, a bit of a gap. So first lesson of the day. <laughs> you, you notice I'm wearing a, a Chinese suit. Why? No tie. I don't need to wear a tie. You know? Engineers and ties. Is that it? <laughs> we, we have this relationship like oil and water. <laughs> so so uh, welcome. I'm, uh, my name is Ming. Uh, I'm going to move. Okay, so oh, can we turn on the projector? Yeah, it's, it's that, this, this is a cartoon picture of me, uh, which looks better than me. <laughs> oh, so this is me. Uh, my name in all four official languages. From, I'm from Singapore, and these are the four official languages. And uh, you, I'm looking my best here in this picture. And you, you, know, you know I'm looking my best because you see less of me. Right? Yeah, every time you see less of me, it's an improvement. <laughs> If you don't believe me, ask my wife. <laughs> so I've been in Google like, like forever. If I look at my Google age, I look like this. <laughs> so I, I joined Google in 2000, back when, when even I was young. Uh, so as, as Stuart say, I have the coolest uh, job title in corporate America. This is my business card. My job title is the Jolly Good Fellow, which nobody can deny. <laughs> um, when, when does this come from? Uh, it came from a joke. As usual, like the best things in life come from jokes. Right? Uh, so, so when I joined Google, it was, the company was so young, everybody had this, all the engineers had the same job title, which was engineer. And then we had a career ladder. Ooh, right? And the highest ranking engineer on the, on the career ladder is the Google Fellow. And so I told a joke. I said, why be the Google Fellow when you can be a jolly good fellow? Right? And everybody laugh, and my philosophy is if everybody laughs, that's the right thing to do. <laughs> so, so I send this for printing, fully expecting this to be denied. Right? Because if they deny it, then I have a new joke to tell, right? because I say nobody can deny, and it is to get denied. Right? So, so either way, I win. <laughs> and it did not get denied. And, and then I was on the front page of the New York Times and it just got stuck. So I couldn't get out of this anymore. <laughs> Speaking on the front page of the New York Times, so this was here. Um, um, it was for a st so, so this is me on the front page of the New York Times and it was for a story called uh, Ming's War. And it's about a Google tradition. The tradition is anybody who's famous who comes to Google must have a picture taken with me and it goes on the war, the war of Ming. Right. And some people say, is, uh, say they tell me, Ming, you have a great war. I say, yeah, of course, I'm Chinese, I build great war, duh. <laughs> uh, it's very funny. Anybody who knows Maya Lin? Uh, Maya Lin was the lady who, who created the, the, the uh, Vietnam Memorial at, at Washington, D.C., and she's Chinese. And then I show her around, I show her my war, and I say, hey, Maya, look, Chinese, build great war, ha. Huh? And she was like, yeah, very funny, ha. Huh? <laughs> And then I found out she's building the Chinese American memorial and it's going to be a war. <laughs> I know, there's something about Chinese and wars. It's very funny. <laughs> so, oh, oh, another thing I want to tell. Uh, so so I, I, I tell all my friends that I'm the only person I know who has been on the front page of the New York Times four times on the same day. <laughs> Take that, cow Rolf. <laughs> Okay, so, so the, who are the people on the wall? Some, uh, these are just four examples. One of these people is not like the others. Any guesses which one it is? <laughs> Any guesses? <laughs> huh, no guesses. Okay, which one? <laughs> okay, you win a prize. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so that's my story. I, I, I tell stories about myself, uh, partly so that it can get used to my accent. Right? And also, uh, for a very strange reason, which is that the story of mindfulness in Google is unfortunately intertwined with my uh, personal story. I mean, unfortunately for Google, not for me. Right? Strangely enough, my story or the sto and the story of mindfulness in Google started with world peace. Right? It started with the idea of of world peace, and I'll tell you what that means. Um, in 2003, I was taking a walk, 
And I was just, that it was a normal summer day, I was just minding my own business, taking a walk outside the Google campus. And then I had, I don't call it epiphany, I call it a, a moment of solidification. Something, a thought solidified in my head. And the thought was, I, told, I, I, I vowed to myself that someday when I'm ready, I want to dedicate my life to humanity. And the way I want to do that is I want to create the conditions for world peace in my lifetime. And the way I want to do that is I want to create the conditions for inner peace, inner happiness, and compassion worldwide. And the way I want to do that is to make the benefits of meditation accessible to humanity. And I figured all that out during my walk. Uh, and, and it became a personal vow. It's something that, that stuck in my head, and i never forgotten it. So starting 2005, I started working on this. Uh, something you need to know about Google Culture. Uh, one thing is that Google Culture is very bottom-up. So innovations come from... We have a lot of autonomy, right? We can do basically what we want. And so a lot of innovations come from bottom-up because engineers do random stuff. And some of the random stuff become products. Uh, in concert with that, there is a policy in Google known as 20% time. Has anybody heard of this? Okay, about, about half of you. So 20% time is the idea that any, any engineer in Google can spend 20% of his time working on anything, anything he wants. Yeah, yeah. So, so I decided that my 20% time is world peace uh, because there's, there's no bigger problem to solve, right? And I started by asking myself, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for world peace? And that's just, I just worked from that point on. Um, so eventually, I came up with something I call Ming's Three Easy Steps to World Peace. <laughs> I, I, I need to tell you a joke. So, so I told that to Lama Sri, yeah, it reminded me of a joke yesterday. I told that to Lama Sri Das. I said, uh, Lama, I have three steps to world peace. And Lama Sri Das said, three steps is too many. Do it in one step. <laughs> sure. Dharma Surya, this is my one step to world peace in three parts. <laughs> yeah, my daughter was like, yeah, very funny, daddy. <laughs> so, step one, or part one for, for Dharma Surya Das, if you are here. Step one is the obvious one, is uh, to start with me. I, I want to be the change I want to see in the world. And so, as an, because I'm an engineer, I, I, have, I have like a measurable target. My measurable target is by the end of this lifetime, I want to have the capacity to be kind to everybody all the time. All kindness, all day. So it's like a kindness channel, right? all kindness, all day. Right? So, so that's my goal. Step two is... I think that meditation has to become a field of science. It has to become scientific. And my, there, there's a historical precedence. The historical precedence is medicine. Uh, yeah, medicine, right? Um, medicine has been practiced for countless generations. And then suddenly, uh, I think arguably the beginning from, from Pasteur and the germ theory, suddenly it became scientific. And once it became scientific, everything about medicine changed. And to me, the most important changes are that it became widely accessible. Like a lot more people have better access to good medicine. And a couple of reasons, because the way uh, providers, the way we train and certify, certify providers changed. Right? The way we measure the effectiveness of the treatment change. So everything changes. And, the way, and everything changes. Magic was taken out of medicine to the benefit of the world. And I think the same thing should happen to meditation. So I, I had this idea, and that was back in like 05, right? Before, this, before it was fashionable, right? like I say, back when I was young. Right? And, and so I, I told this to a couple of my friends, men of science, men of Zen, and so on and there was no traction. Uh, I only found there was traction when, when I, I became a friend of Alan Wallace, and Alan told me, I've been working on what you're talking about for six years, because the Dalai Lama told me to. And then I figured I must be on the right track, because the Dalai Lama and I cannot both be wrong at the same time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> at least I think. Right? So I must be doing something right. <laughs> 
So, so eventually, uh, I started uh, uh, working on, on this, in this, in this uh, direction, but, and, but not, not fully. I just uh, used my, the whatever money I have. Uh, and together with one guy, I'm going to show you, show you his picture. Uh, his name is Tenzin something or other. <laughs> <laughs> so, so four of us, and uh, this guy and me, we are two of us, we founded a center in Stanford called the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, C-Care. The idea behind C-Care is to study compassion as a scientific subject. Because if we understand compassion scientifically, maybe we know how to replicate it worldwide. 